All right, good morning. As a lovely couple said to me in the lobby of my hotel room this morning, happy Fosdom. Uh, I think it's been eight years since I was here last. It still looks the same. There's a little more water on the floor this year. Uh, the weather is a bit worse, but otherwise it feels pretty great. So this is my first presentation on MariaDB, MySQL, and so on in quite some time. And what I initially envisioned was going to be a knockout. 20 minutes, tightly compressed of beautiful slides, great information. And yeah, well, let's set those expectations a little bit lower. Let's go with mediocre slides, information that many of you already know, and opinions from someone who's been out of it, out of this community for, oh, let's say about 10 years. First, let's start by reworking the title, Patterns and Anti-Patterns in OSS Participation. To be more specific, really, we're talking about, interestingly, actually, free software and open source, of course. We have uh, a project and a company that are now based purely on free software, like MariaDB, as it is GPL licensed, fits that definition. And the ecosystem we're talking about isn't the broader open source or even free software and open source ecosystem. It's, of course, this mixed ecosystem that we live and work in, where we have corporate actors, nonprofits, hobbyists, lots of adjacent projects. It's a different space than the general space. The other interesting thing here that occurred to me as I worked on this deck was it's not just any project. It's a project that's been running for a while. Um, MySQL has been uh, initially Unireg, Bonti's um, database-ish system in 91, and it's evolved and forked and changed and split. Now there's Drizzle, which is sadly dead, and WebScale DB, which is sadly dead, and Percona Server and MariaDB itself. There are all these interesting variants that are left over, all complex, wonderful, interesting projects that have a lot of technical debt in some ways. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. So also, I realized that most of you probably won't know me now. When I started working at MySQL in 2001, I was the first community manager. And I had the good luck of going to conferences and having people usually figure out who I was pretty quickly. And I came to the conclusion I must be popular and likable. But mostly it was that MySQL was popular and likable in those days. And I found later on working for less important projects that actually I was relatively ordinary. Um, so here I am some years ago with Monty and a few other folks. Um, this was a while back. So this presentation has also been about diving back in to find out what's been happening lately. And it has been fascinating. I had no idea that there um, were some of the MySQL forks that there are. It's been neat to dig into those. When I started this presentation, my working assumption was that it had gotten easier to contribute to MySQL and all of its various forks. That the position that we had at MySQL back in the day, which was that it was too difficult to contribute to the core, which is why there are so few core contributions, had been proven false. And when I chatted with um, my new colleagues at the MariaDB Foundation, the early chats led me to think, we've done it, we've overcome it. How? And this, for reference, is pretty much the line that we had for a lot of years. We were saying it back in 2000. Morton Mikos, former CEO of MySQL, was saying it in 2008. Five years to get into the code of the server. So when I started digging in a little bit, I saw, oh, this is great. I ran a few naive commands in Git, and I'm like, there are 174 contributors to the GitHub MariaDB repository alone. This is fantastic. But then I started digging in. And note, I'm just focusing on the server. It doesn't mean that the other contributions don't matter, but the server is an interesting point to dig into because it is complicated and because it was hard to contribute to. There are also the other incredibly valuable contributions like documentation and storage engines and user-defined functions and um, providing support on forums and all sorts of other things. So I started off in the spirit of my initial presentation with fancy graphics. So here I took um, all of the commits 
um, and graphed them out as a stream graph by committer over time, all the way back from the commits that were imported into GitHub from the early days of MySQL, in, uh, starting in 2000 and moving all the way forward to the present date. I thought, well, I can't really tell much by looking at that. In fact, uh, maybe I'm in a club somewhere in Amsterdam in the 1990s and there's music playing and yeah, not useful. So I used simpler tools and started digging in. Dear Git, please tell me in the last year, how many unique email addresses were there for the committers? Oh, huh, 79. That's, that's okay. I mean, there are, you know, 20 some odd engineers at the MariaDB Corporation, and there are, you know, say 10 or so, five or 10 engineers at the MariaDB Foundation, and that doesn't seem like a lot. So how many, how many contributor domains are there, Git? Please, please tell me. Hmm. So there are 25 unique domains. That doesn't feel like a lot of contributors to me. So what do those numbers actually look like over time? Well, for each of these years, we end up having, you know, at the highest point in 2006, there are 386 contributors. And it's dwindled down over time. And of course, the earlier years were MySQL as a whole. And I thought, well, we have to dig in a little bit more to see. And it's time to go back to using a bit of a fancy graph instead of just fancy bits of command line stuff. Let's dump the data into a form we can work with it and then stick it into another stream graph. And on the left-hand side, we have the organizations just done by taking the domain names of contributor email addresses and looking at them. So we can see here that over the last year, on that left side, and I'll go back so you can see the, uh, the comparison, you've got all these domains on the left-hand side. So these are the folks that have committers that have email addresses at mariadb.com, mariadb.org, and so on. And if we dive in a bit, we see things like, yeah, mariadb.com at the top with volume of commits. And then below, mariadb.org, next. And then below, askmonty.org. Thinking, what the hell? Well, there are still some legacy email addresses in use. Committers haven't necessarily updated the, their uh, uh, Git preferences. So what people are these when we go and look over by domain? And so then we can see, oh yeah, so Marco from the corporation. A lot of commits in 2018. Um, Sergey Golubchik, um, consistent contributor from the early 2000s. Um, perhaps needs to update his gate settings. Um, Alexander Barkov, Vladislav, I don't know. But if we go through the list, there are probably a good number of names that many of us recognize. At least for me, there are a lot of former colleagues in here, especially in the higher volumes of contributions. And if we look down here at the lower volumes, well, Gmail, well, that's a bit generic. GitHub, mm, that's weird. Dbart, well, that's going to be another Maria Corporation um, uh, uh, employee. Monty Program, someone else needs to update their, their Git configuration. So with my initial hypothesis being we've got a lot of contributors now, actually, we have a moderate number of contributors. Many of them have been with the project for a long time, in some cases coming up on 20 years. And of course, one over 20 years. And it got me thinking as I looked through the commits, as I dug around a bit more, as I looked at um, uh, Oracle's um, uh, uh, commits and so on, it seems to be that the hypothesis we had nearly 20 years ago of it's hard to get into the server is true. And chatting with the contributors who work on the server code now, um, they say things like, yeah, I'm, I'm four years in, uh, and I hope one day to understand the code base completely. Maybe the fifth year will bring them enlightenment. It's interesting, and there, I think there are a lot of reasons for it, and I'll, I'll get into this in just a minute. I probably should have changed the order here. So let's quickly chat about how adoption fits in. So we have this 
database engine ranking from dbengines.com, I think. It's a huge ranking. It's super interesting. They track 343 different database systems. 140-something of them are now relational systems. I was blown away because I didn't realize how many systems had come into being recently. You can see on this logarithmic uh, uh, chart, so logarithmic on the left side, the MariaDB score over time. You can read up on their method for scoring on their site. And yeah, it's really going quite quickly. At the top, you have Oracle, MySQL, SQL Server, uh, dominant in the space for a long time. You have PostgreSQL um, being the other one that is trending upwards. Um, and then you have all the others. SQLite is a nice benchmark in the middle. DB2 is relatively flat. So MySQL and variants, MariaDB and so on, have a lot of people using them. There are many, many, many available, or there's a large pool of available contributors. So it seems that this hypothesis that it's tough to get into the code must hold true because if there are so many more people who could get into it, why aren't they? I think some of it we can explain by looking here. This is a handy diagram that I stole from Realm. They make a mobile database of sorts that I have not looked at one bit. And they tried to graph out the introduction of new database technologies over um, a 10-year period. And they missed a few things, like I don't see Berkeley DB on there anywhere. There are other systems that they missed, but it's accurate enough. There's this explosion at the end of where people need databases. They need databases that are relatively specialized. But the effort of digging into a mature, complex, um, long-term code base like MySQLs, like MariaDBs, it's pretty daunting. I think often it's easier to start something on your own or fork. There are, I think, four, three or four MySQL forks in that list than it is to dive directly into a project. And we see this in many other projects. If you look at, say, PostgreSQL, there were five years in the early days of refactoring that code base to make it so that uh, normal mortals could work on it, or well, abnormal mortals. I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, but you have to be pretty skilled to work on any database engine code base. And the same thing with, say, um, um, the um, uh, Netscape code base. That had to have heavy refactoring into Firefox before it could become reasonably accessible to a larger group. There are some things that should further contribution, that should make it easier in the MariaDB space at least. So recently there have been programs at the foundation to enable new contributors, to provide the kind of mentoring that's needed. If I look at all the names that are heavy contributors in those previous sets of graphs, they're people who had uh, access to, for the early ones, direct access to Monty. So they could talk with someone who understood the internals very well. Later on, the contributors could talk with people like, um, say, Serg or um, Eric Herman, who also had deep insights from working with Monty, from working on the code base. There is a strong mentoring component. You need to have access to someone who can tell you why the code does something in a certain way, because it's not always obvious. And this is, I think, one thing where we can start to make more of a difference. In the old days with MySQL, regardless of who the owner was, there was a corporation. You would hire people. You would have some contributors from outside who usually worked for large organizations that pushed the database like hell and that needed to fix some specific issue, but might not generally work on the product. And nowadays, with MariaDB at least, there's the corporation on one side who has that similar pattern. They have developers they employ. They do a tremendous amount of good work on the code, but they've got commercial motives. Um, and they can't necessarily mentor less committed, say, full-time employed committers. And that's where the foundation comes in. They're able. We're able to mentor people in a way that, say, a corporation can't and build structures that help people get into the code base. In all of this, as I focused on the server and as I focused on the time ticking along, we can't forget that there are many other ways to contribute. Um, if we try to distill all of this down into about, let's say, four big points, the patterns that work well over time Invest in people. The, I think with every complex project, 
When a developer gets into it, there's a larval phase where you eat, sleep, code. Um, and that takes real support. You have to have the financial resources to do it. You have to be at the right stage in your life to do it. And it's a lot easier if you have help from someone who knows the code base. And even if, I think this applies to any project, investing in people who are in the right pl place to learn the code base and to help others, helping them learn uh, positive community norms, critical. I think the next thing is you have to respect the technical debt of a project. Um, years ago at MySQL, we, we came into the old Adibus code base, which became MaxDB. And that code base had a lot of technical debt. It had been developed for a very long time. It was a very forward-looking product. It was very advanced, but it was written in Pascal. And that Pascal was transpiled into C. And then that C was hacked further. And then it was turned into a finished set of binaries. I could not ever manage to successfully build um, um, SAPDB, MaxDB on my own after making any changes to anything. And the pitfalls were kind of comic, like you needed one version of Python, not earlier, not later, to build it, period, one version. And I didn't realize this. I had the most up-to-date version. So for these projects, I think sometimes we have to say it's easier to stop and refactor. It's easier to move on and do your own project until you understand something better. There are lots of great projects, SQLite, for example, that begin with some exploration with saying, hey, the existing stuff is too complicated. I don't get it. I want to try to re-implement using what is more state-of-the-art now. I think an important pattern is understanding the value exchange. In the early days of open source, people had this naive view that I don't think any of us hold anymore, which is people contribute just because they enjoy it. But enjoyment isn't enough. You have to be able to feed yourself. You, you have to enjoy the people that you work with. There are, are many things that fit in with these needs. And when you've got a complex product that demands a lot from you to work on it, you need to make sure that you're supported or that you support the people who are doing this complex work. And so this means at times, in some nonprofit spaces, people do things like they give coders grants. The coders that are digging into something that requires a lot of focus get some money so they can, they can spend their time working on it. Maybe we should look at the same thing with the foundation. And we do certainly employ a good number of developers to give them that time and space to focus on, on a complex code base. And the thing that I've, of course, danced around the entire time is contribution at the core is just one piece. In most projects, the highest value comes at the boundaries between projects, where you make things talk to each other, the client APIs, the um, storage engines, um, user-defined functions, um, the places where you take two or more things that each have value on their own, and you combine them in a way that creates more value than you would have had before. And so good examples are in the early days would have been things like PHP, where PHP plus MySQL powered a whole bunch of people's careers and say, what, 60% of the web, together with Apache and Linux at some point in history. It's the combinations that really bring out the best in open source, I think. And so it's easy to focus on the server as being, oh yeah, we have to make it easier to contribute. But we can also make it a lot easier to keep contributing at the boundaries, to make it so the places where people most likely need or most often need to extend are easiest to extend. Um, if we think about it just mathematically, the number of people who will want to make a product work with another product is probably much higher than the number of people who want to extend an existing product because there are dozens of programming, well, hundreds of programming languages. There are dozens and dozens of frameworks. There are so many systems that work with databases that numerically they just vastly outweigh the others. So with 30 seconds, well, in five seconds, 35 seconds left, I will say thank you and see if there are any questions.